Hey, this is Wally, and you're listening to the Young Justice Files on the Whelmed podcast, or whatever. Whelmed? Dick, did you make him say that? Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Marie Claire, D-3-4. Initiate Part 1. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Mary Claire Gould. Mary Claire grew up impassioned by philosophy, theology, mythology, and game design as the daughter of Wilf K. Backhouse, creator of one of the first role-playing games, Chivalry and Sorcery. Mary Claire has merged all of these passions into her own projects, including playing Dryden Silverkin in the Dungeons and Dragons actual play podcast Tavern Tales, and as the host of the Star Wars discussion podcast What the Force, with an upcoming discussion session from Young Justice's own Vanessa Marshall. Mary Claire, welcome to Whelmed. Thank you, Rich. I'm really excited to be here. I love Young Justice. Maybe not as much as I love Star Wars, but it's still really great. Oh. Well, you got <laughs> Vanessa Marshall on first, so I can't, I can't hold it against you. <laughs> She's really wonderful. I'm really, she, yeah, is a doll. Maybe we'll share our <laughs> Vanessa Marshall stories later on. <laughs> but before before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a couple things in the intro, but I want you to tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do out in the world. Sure. So um, my background is actually in psychology, and I was lucky to grow up in sort of this, I don't know, almost like incubator for critical thinking and for meta-analysis in that my dad and I would literally talk about everything from Star Wars to role-playing games to philosophy to myth Sounds and like history, <laughs> um, you know, just around the kitchen table. Or I'd be like, hey, dad, I'm thinking about this this really cool thing. And he'd be like, well, you know, you could, you could read some Kant to, to understand that a little bit more. And, you know. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe that is like how I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he really challenged me to have my own thoughts and then to discuss them with him. And he was always such a giving person in that he made sure I not only challenged myself, but that I right. felt welcome and on the same level playing field to challenge him with new concepts and new ideas. And he I was he was always such a giving father mentor person. And it made me really, especially Star Wars was a big thing for us. So when I was a teenager, we went to all of the remastered extended edition versions that came back right. into theater. And Throughout that, because I was going through kind of adolescence at the time, he and I would talk about like, hey, these are these are really poignant for what I'm going through. We had this open dialogue about pretty much everything. I was very lucky. <laughs> you're, you're making me tear up, actually, because all I'm thinking about is like, you know, being a, a father to two young kids and particularly a daughter, I'm constantly thinking about like giving them that that support and encouragement to be them. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully they they're interested in the things I'm interested in, but you know, we approach things from an analytical and creative and imaginative standpoint and they both seem to have my perhaps overactive imagination. Um so I want to be there to guide them into the places they want to go and try not to like push them to go somewhere that I want them to go instead. Do you know what I mean? Like, are you interested in this? And if you are, then yes, then let's do this. I'm happy to. But what else are you interested in? And yeah. it's this fine line of like not wanting to control your kids, but also wanting to, you know what I mean? And and storytelling is, and the stories that we tell ourselves through the media of the time is so important to- I like that phrase. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah? The The stories we tell ourselves is something that, Philosophically, Crispin Freeman touched on in his discussion mm -hmm. with us, but it's something that I was taught through 
my shamanic studies, like the stories we tell ourselves. But I like the, the way that you phrased like. Well, it's the media of the time, right? Because like it changes. Yeah, it does. And, and sometimes we lose perspective on like older media and the importance of that older media because maybe it doesn't necessarily fall in line with current philosophical belief or, you know, it, uh, thinking mm-hmm. and not taking into account its, it's a word I'm thinking of, like the scaffolded, you know, moving, hopefully we're moving forward mm-hmm. in sociological or mythological development. And, but those other things that we did were really important because I know people are like, they blow off Star Wars, like, oh, well, but they did this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. And I'm like, yeah, it was also the very first trilogy that ever existed of its kind. So maybe give it a break. And very much (laughs) like, like very much Star Wars is the zeitgeist of the time. So back Mm -hmm. then in the seventies, when it came out, that's what needed to be told. And George Lucas has just recently come out and said, yeah, it's about anti-fascism. Didn't you know? Like, (laughs) You it's know? so subtle. It's subtle, yeah. right? And nowadays, you can actually see... Maybe if the jackboots were a little higher, maybe <laughs> that would help. Yeah, and the and the walking was a little, like, more straight <laughs> right. leg. It was, right. <laughs> right. The, they were way too casual walkers to tell that they were Nazis. And, like, yeah. nowadays, like, it's more about the trouble of adolescence and also the, the switch in the female lens, right? So the female gaze is changing is the stories are becoming wider and we're including more people in the storytelling. And you can hear that when you hear pretty much anybody talk about it who has, you know, uh, a female perspective that these stories in the sequel trilogy have meant more to them than any of the stories that have come before. And it's not that way for everybody, but certainly the needle is moving, which is really interesting to say that the Star Wars is the zeitgeist. Yeah, I just we I just heard uh, so friends of the show, uh, Emily and Senda, who are the hosts of the amazing She's a Super Geek podcast. They were yeah. just guested on a, a new podcast that came out called I Am Here mm-hmm. uh, or I Am Here. There's a little bit of a pause there. I think there's a comma in there, which is pretty cool. But Senda was just talking about that, like. Mm-hmm. Whatever she's watching the new Star Wars films that have this female protagonist that isn't just Princess Leia, right? Mm-hmm. She she comes out crying. And she's like, it doesn't matter how good or maybe not good or if I have issues with the story or not have issues with the story, I get to be represented up there, right? Yeah. Like I'm seeing something and like, and there's more than just the one cookie cutter Oh, not cookie cutter. Leia is definitely not cookie cutter. But like, you know, there's not just this one, okay, the one one person. It's okay. You can say there was one woman for like 30 years. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Well, basically, and she was awesome and we all loved her. But you know what I mean? Like you see, okay, well, that's that's the one I get. Right? In The Last Jedi, we have every phase of woman represented because we have the young sort of, um, in a way, adolescent Rose, who is like the geek oh, girl true. who doesn't really know who she is and where she, whether she actually belongs in this rebellion or what her role in the rebellion is. We have Ray, yeah. who's now this young woman who's trying to discover who she is, uh, what she's all about. We have Leia, yeah. who is the mother, who has, uh, you know, going through the troubles and tribulations of having a son that is out mm-hmm. there in the world who maybe she doesn't agree with all of the choices that he's made and has made mistakes and that trouble. We have Holdo, who is the adult female professional who has chosen to not have children, but to actually give her life over to her career and her cause. And we have Maz, who's like the kick-ass grandma, who's just seen it all, (laughs) who's just like, all right, children. That's definitely a good description of Maz. (laughs) Right? So although although Ryan Johnson... I'm going to picture Maz very differently from now She's totally a grandma, like a kick-ass grandma. She's totally a grandma. She's totally like a kick-ass grandma has seen it all. It's amazing. Um, but you have these these females who have been through different phases of their lives, which right. to Ryan Johnson, like some of them maybe didn't hit well. Some people didn't like Rose. Some people didn't like, you know, some people didn't identify with right. those people, but you identify with maybe different people at different phases of your life, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this, I mean... This kind of folds into a little bit of what we were going to talk about in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, in a way, because the first thing you were talking about was like this, these stages, right? Mm-hmm. So you had, you had Rose, you had, just talking about Rose and Ray and Leia, 
right? Yeah. So the first thing that pops into my head is the Mother Maiden Crone yes. like trilogy, right? Yes. I'm going to bookmark that for a minute because I want to pull us back to to get a little bit more history and then we're going to do a deep dive into some some of this stuff you and I were talking about online <laughs> that I was like, that's enough. Stop talking. <laughs> we're going to record this. We're getting you Because I can show. geek out about like this all day long. Is that? <laughs> yes. Passion is life. Geekery is passion. Geekery is life. All right. So, so we, we get an idea of where like your history came from. Like this is something you were just embroiled in from a very early age, <laughs> but, but let's talk about Young Justice. So when did you first see Young Justice then? Did you see it on DVD, Netflix, the original run? Netflix. And I like, much to my husband's chagrin, I um, binge watched it like all in like a week period. Like I, I do that. Without him? Without him, and then he had to catch up later. And now my daughter has now seen my daughter and my son. Um, my daughter is ten years old and starting that adolescent journey. Has just yeah. finished watching it all now, and uh, she geeks out about it with her friends over mm. over FaceTime, and they're chatting about the different heroes and the different stories that they represent. And oh, the thing you're making me so happy right now. I know it's like y- you got to get them while they're young. <laughs> Right. Um, And the thing that really struck me was, you know, similar to Star Wars, where Star Wars is one story really aimed at 10 to 13 year olds trying to show them how to become, how to fulfill and how to get through this very complicated stage that is adolescence. With the stories, the monomyth, I know Crispin talked about it previously, but with with the stories that we tell ourselves to get us through those phases, there are other stories out there, but the monomyth, the classic hero's journey is all about that. And what I love about Young Justice is that it represents it so much better than the adult justice. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's, Absolutely. Yeah, there's several reasons for that, which is awesome. Well, I, I've talked about this on the show. The difference, growing up to me, the difference between the Justice League and the Titans comics were that the Justice League was about fighting aliens and supervillains and stuff. But if you wanted to know about what was happening in Bruce's life or Hal's life, you had a comic book to go to. Mm-hmm. And you could go read, you know, the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series where they were traveling around the United States or whatever, you know, seeing how real people live. You didn't get that for any of the sidekicks. So when the sidekicks were given their own comics, so when their sidekicks were given Titans, Mm -hmm. you got both. You got them fighting these villains. You also got them growing up as teenagers, as a family and a group, all in the same book. And to me, that was what, like, this difference you get. Like, it it was a space to explore these things. And, And Nightwing... You know, Robin growing up and becoming Nightwing and coming of age just hit me at that the time when I was 14. I was 14 years old, you know, with lots of changes going on. So my brother was coming back from the Air Force. He'd been gone for four years. Like I didn't grow up with him around. My dad traveled a lot. So I just didn't have a lot of male role models around. I had a lot of friends. But like having Dick Grayson there and seeing that transition was really important. And I think that the people who dismiss these kinds of stories like young justice don't understand story and what it's Mm. for or like what, what it can be used to present. It is modern mythology, right? Mm -hmm. The myths were supposed to tell us these ideas of telling us like giving us these moral tales, you know, of how to properly do something or not do something depending on, you know, where you are or whatever. Without them, you're reinventing the wheel a lot. Yeah. And these stories can be told well and give us those lessons, which makes me so happy. Something to relate to. Someone someone to make you feel like you're not alone. Like, oh, I made that mistake. Or, mm-hmm. oh, I, I remember what happened when Superboy decided not to think 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 through. Can I tell you something really interesting? Um, so there's been... No. I, so there's been... <laughs> yes, a, please. This is actually from my psychology background. I keep up with psychology, um, even though I've kind of moved into uh, a different sort of role professionally and personally I talk about really whatever I want on my on my own podcast <laughs> yes because <laughs> it's all about whatever I want um, exactly. but so they've done research into especially how powerful storytelling is and 
in Texas, they ran this pilot program to rehabilitate inmates who had not had violent crimes, but had made minor mistakes. And instead of, and so this is where narrative is super important, and I'll tell you a little bit why. (laughs) So why, what happened was instead of putting them into prison, they actually went directly to parole and they had to attend a literature class once a week. Okay. And they had to read stories that were related to what they were, what their crimes they had committed and how those heroes or those protagonists overcame those issues and it helps them put it into perspective. And there's several psychological reasons why that happened, but they had almost a 98 percentage uh, percent no repeat offender outcome from the program. Yeah. But this is a long tradition of telling stories of things that you have gone through from a narrative perspective or that you're about to go through so you can can draw back onto that. Because if you can self-insert, so if you can get yourself into that headspace, yes, you can think through, oh, hey, you know, I remember when Superboy made that mistake and he used that patch because you know, it felt like he could be more in that moment, right. but then mm-hmm. it drug him down. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And and it doesn't even have to be that direct or blatant. No. It can be subtly changing the mind. And where was I discussing this? Oh, I did a I did a, a voice. I did some voiceover work for a podcast called Have Spellbook Will Travel. And they did a little behind the scenes and we had a discussion about this with James and Tricasso and Rudy Basso. But I was talking about um, stories are magic. Yeah. It's magic. You can change how someone thinks based on the stories that you're telling them. Mm-hmm. And it takes responsibility to do it. It's what Crispin was saying. This idea of we are the stories that we tell ourselves. We become those stories. Our truths become based on those stories. So even if you, what had happened with stories like the X-Men and Titans and other things in the 80s is you would read through these things and see the problems that these, you know, mutants were going through and you'd come out the other side and you'd be like, wow, that's crazy. You know, like this is such a cool action story and I really felt for these characters and that kind of stuff. And you might not even realize that you're reading, at least at the time, heavily about racism, Mm -hmm. you know, coming out of the 70s and the 80s and particularly in the 60s when it was first created, you'd come out of it and realize, wait, if things were shifted and we all had a different quote unquote enemy, Mm -hmm. right? And we were all on this one side, would we team up even though our skin color was different against these people who are scary to us, even though their skin color is different? You know what I mean? Like you, you don't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily have to reference specific instances. It would just slowly influence how you think. Mm -hmm. And to do that, it requires responsibility and, and the awareness of your own stories and other people's stories and how they how they interact. So you know, and that yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. no, no. So psychologically, what ends up happening is because not everybody has the ability to meta think. Right. Do you do you know what that is? Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Well, I do, but t- yeah. but talk about it. Okay. For the so audience. so meta meta thought is the ability to understand and react to and change your own thinking. So maybe I'm blowing some people's minds here, but this is, uh, it's like meditation in a way. It just takes practice. You recognize you have had a thought. What is that thought? And you call it out and you say, that is a thought. And you can recognize, hey, maybe that thought was because I was hungry. Maybe that thought was because I was sad, you know? Yes. And you, you adjust it and work with it. And what storytelling does is allows us to have those thoughts without knowing how to do that. Right. And my, my wife is a special education teacher, and she also has degrees in psychology. So uh, cognitive behavioral therapy mm-hmm. is a concept that's used to have this awareness. Watch your thoughts. Watch your reaction to those thoughts and see how and why you're reacting in a particular way so that you can then know the story you're telling yourself or know where it came from to change it. In my shamanic studies, we called it stalking thoughts. Mm. And it's the same thing. It's taking that time and energy to, to not just do something, but watch what's going on in your own mind and your own head. 
And if you can do that, you it's exhausting. <laughs> but if you can do that, you can start catching yourself before you fall down holes that are negative for yourself. But like, like you're saying, I totally agree with you. This idea, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I kind of understood it, the idea that you're saying, mm-hmm. but I, I'd never had it put into words about the idea that maybe... I know it's hard to do, but the idea that people can't do that or is they, something that they my have wife never and I been, have been taught, discussing. right? They've never been taught or, you know? Yeah. Well, my, my wife and I have been having this discussion about something called aphantasia. You know what aphantasia is? No. So aphantasia is this, it, 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 it occurs in about 5 to 10% of the population, apparently. Aphantasia is the inability to visualize things in your mind. Oh, wait. Yeah, no, sorry. I do know what that is. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's like for me, I have like a holodeck dream life at, at night. Mm-hmm. It's exhausting, right? My wife doesn't have that. So it's it took us a long time to understand that that changed how we view the world. Mm. Like I would add, she just doesn't picture things the way that I do. And she has, but she has a pinpoint sense of direction and my sense of direction is horrifying. So like we both have these strengths and weaknesses and it's not that I'm just not trying to have a sense of direction. It's it, it takes me so much exhausting work to do things that take her no energy at all and vice versa. So this idea that you're talking about that, you know, it nobody's been trained to do that, but even if we do train people to do that, sometimes and they, they can. can there yeah. there are probably people out there who can't, literally yeah. can't do it neurologically. So maybe story allows them a way to kind of an end around, you know, like a like yeah. a, a sneak around for that, which I think is fascinating. To Crispin's point, it speaks to the lizard brain. It it right. it 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 gets past the sort of, you know, frontal cortex that maybe it wasn't aligned in that way in you and it can help you understand stuff. So I have a, I have a, I have a good friend who's actually a, a social worker and he works with troubled youth and he uses right. the stories of comics and he uses the stories of Star Wars and says, I just need you to go and watch this and tell me what you feel about the main character's situation. And then come yeah. back and talk to me and say, do you, feel parallels to your own situation. And it's right. a way of breaking it down to get themselves out of their own heads. And I feel like at adolescence, not all kids are in a, a hormonal, <laughs> mental, right. you know, space to be able to do that. And they probably haven't figured that out yet. You know, sometimes that takes until they're 25 to figure out, hey, I can actually think about my own world you know, maybe it's a lot of yoga that, that gets them into their mindfulness, right? Maybe it's right. something else and maybe some t- they just can't. But storytelling almost circumvents that. And I think that that's why it's so powerful and why the monomyth exists in the way that it does, which it keeps on coming back because it needs to be told, which is, hey, you're going to be okay. You're going to have some bumps, but you're going to get there. Right. You're going you're gonna to go... You're going to go into a thing. It's going to be hard. You're going to go to the belly of the beast, mm-hmm. so to speak. And you're going to come out the other side with something, with additional wisdom. Yeah. And guess what? It's going to happen again. <laughs> and then it's going to happen again. Yeah. And it's all going to be, it's either going to be different or if you don't learn the lesson the first time, the lesson will keep coming up until you figure it out. Right? And this is, I agree with you entirely. So this kind of blends a little bit of what we were talking, going to talk about, which is not just the psychology of things, which I, the, I'm, I'm all about this, <laughs> but also the mythology of things. Yes. Um, because when we were talking uh, online, you said something like th- this parallel between the Justice League and, and you know, Greek myths or whatever is, yes. is, not, un- is not uncommon. Or, or Superman being a, a stand-in Jesus figure where, mm-hmm. you know, Jor-El sent his only son to Earth and blah, blah, blah. Pretty obvious stuff. But something you said that never occurred to me for some reason young justice. was that, yeah. yeah, the Justice League are gods, but young, the young Justice characters, therefore, by parallel and in storytelling, are demigods. Yes. Please dive into this thing you started to dive I just, into. I get I get shivers whenever I think about this. So I was like, whoa, like even just the I'm sorry, just the parallel between <laughs> Superboy not being able to fly and like being, oh my God, yeah. I just go, go, well, go. So go, go. like let's let's talk about Superboy because he's to me the most direct example of being actually a demigod because he is made up of the genetics yes. of yes. Lex Luthor. And right. The God figure, Superman, who is, I mean, 
let's just say Superman is a god. We can we can say that. I think that's that's fair, right? Let's just say. Where, yeah. where, yeah, that's fair. where does fair. Superman actually live? Like, you know, from a work perspective. Right. Are you talking about Superman or Clark? You're, I Superman. assume you're talking about Superman. Superman. So the Fortress of Solitude, right? But, like that but kind where of does Mount he meet Olympus with the other gods? Oh, where does he meet? The Hall of Justice? Is that what you mean? No, or like in the or the Watchtower? That or is, the Watchtower? The Watchtower. Yeah. It depends on the myth, but yeah. Yeah, but but the Watchtower, maybe, maybe the Hall of Justice is the Parthenon, this place where the mortals can yes. come and see the gods. <laughs> but Love the it. Watchtower is yes. Olympus. Olympus is, is where the demigods, the young justice heroes, are forbidden from going to. They uh. they feel taken away from. They feel like they're not quite worthy. They don't know what they need to do to become worthy. And occasionally, some of the demigods end up being promoted to gods, just like in myth, once they have done enough heroic duties to become worthy. What? What? Yes. I'm there's going to be a pause here. <laughs> How do I process this cuz it's so good. The Hall of Justice is the Parthenon. It's so good. Cuz it's where people go to worship the gods. It's not actually yeah. where the gods live. That's true. And and in in the case of so this whole idea of the of the Hall of Justice. So the Hall of Justice, if I remember correctly, and someone's welcome to correct me on this, the Hall of Justice, as I understand it, was created more for the ca- cartoon in the 1970s. So the Super Friends cartoon. Mm-hmm. The The Watchtower wasn't in, in, introduced because satellites weren't like a common thing. Like the Watchtower wasn't introduced until significantly later. And before that, just like in the com, just like in, in Young Justice, the, the Justice League met in the cave. Mm-hmm. So the, ca- the cave was the Justice League's home base. And that has a very primordial Gaia feel, right? right. Of the yeah. origin, the the where they all came from was right. Mother Earth. And the fact that the Young Justice team is stuck in the cave, it, they're right. stuck and bound to the Earth. It's it's really wonderful parallels. It's amazing. But this idea that the that the Hall of Justice and the Watchtower exist in the same kind of thought process and continuity is not a common thing. Mm-hmm. Was not common before Young Justice. So this idea that 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 Greg and Brandon, the creative team, created a a space in which the cave, the Hall of Justice, and the Watchtower are all like stages of development of the Justice yeah. League over time within the same kind of story arc is so brilliant to me. And this idea that the Hall of Justice was there, I have a love-hate relationship with the old Super Friends show. I watched it passionately when I was a kid. And as an adult, it, there's parts of it that just make my head twitch. So when I see the Hall of Justice, I both have this wonderful nostalgia and also, oh, can we do something else? But Young Justice changed all that for me because I was like, oh, now it has a place. Yeah. It has a, it has a place in the mythology there. And this Parthenon aspect of it is killing me. But what is so fascinating? So the the let's let's open the curtains to the show. The first episode, we have the three main you know superheroes that start out the show, right? right. So we have Aqualad, we have Robin, and we have Kid Flash, and we're supposed to have Speedy, right? But he's right. he's all grumpy, which is his own hero's journey, which is really amazing as well. But yes, so they they're coming up and they're like, yeah, we're gonna be Justice Leaguers, and they get them in the door. <laughs> Which is much like myth, in myth, part of, especially Greek myths, um, a common through thread is when the god actually acknowledges that this child actually exists from a demigod perspective. As opposed to like this idea that like how Zeus or Jupiter, like they would have these kids and they just didn't know or care and they were off doing their own thing. Well, like they were always like around kind of creating these inspirations because because children in the Greek myths kind of cover uh, inspirations and whether they're actually something that is inspiring enough to inspire others is a different co- question, right? Oh, right. And so they are being acknowledged. And we see this a lot in the Percy Jackson books by Rick, Riar- okay. Rick Riordan. Yeah. He 
there's a big difference between they recognize that this person is a demigod and they recognize that this person is the demigod of, oh, child of Poseidon, you know, child of <laughs> of Zeus. You know, there's a big right. difference if they're just, you know, an unacknowledged demigod versus an actual acknowledged <laughs> demigod. OK, because right? that means that they are yeah. they are that person's representative. They carry that person's symbol that gods, yeah. they are on quests for that god. Interesting. Right? Yeah, Hercules yeah. is mm-hmm. on a quest, or Heracles is on a quest for Hera, right? Even though he is the child of Zeus. It's just, right. it's really, really, it's got that, it's got that uh, gravitas to the storytelling. And like psychologically and mythologically, they're not quite there yet. They have to become, they have to complete quests. They end up coming home with, prizes thank you kid flash (laughs) thank you wally souvenir they come home with these treasures much like you know the argo going out Mm -hmm. and getting the golden fleece you know Mm -hmm. there's all of these wonderful parallels to greek myth okay (laughs) i'm processing this a little bit okay 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 so 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 you got so we we've we've dipped into some psychology. Mm-hmm. We've dipped into some mythology. But it's all connected. Yeah, and and now I want to dive into this Venn diagram of the of take so we've talked about on the show in the past this idea of to every teenager, I know I was <laughs> this is it for me. I I will make the blanket statement of every teenager. Everything is life or death. Mm-hmm. There's an extremity to the decisions that you make that that will affect everything. It goes mm-hmm. on your permanent record, right? Like it, it's it's everything is life or death. And when you take that idea and you merge it with superpowers in which things are literally physically life or death, mm-hmm. it can give you these amazing ideas and stories, right? But fundamentally, it's about the character and the exactly and the feelings that they're feeling and the growth that they need to go through. Exactly. There's that parallel there. And I want, I, I'm, I'm seeing now that you're bringing up both the psychology and the mythology of this thing. I see like merging those things together in a very similar way, this idea, because there are, there are psychological archetypes, right? Mm-hmm. There's psychological archetypes that in many ways kind of uh, stitch into or parallel to these mythological archetypes that typically take place within a pantheon of, of classic gods, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so... Can you talk about that a little bit? Like the archetypes of teenagerhood or the archetypes of of that and its cross with this mythology? Like the the and 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 then taking those and merging them into this teenager's <laughs> story arc where things are life or death. Do you know what I do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no. Um what I think is happening from the teenager life or death thing is that um, first, I want to just make this point, and then I'll I'll think about the archetypes. Do it. Do it. Dive in. <laughs> so, so from a teenage perspective, um, well, from a from a growth perspective, what children as they mature into adults go through is the early years, which is it's mm-hmm. if you compare it to testing a computer system, is like an alpha test. It's testing the basics of how they're developing as as humans, right? So they have to learn how to walk and stumble and fall and test that they can jump off of things. So they're, you know, especially up to, you know, age seven, usually from a developmental okay. perspective, they're the ones that are climbing off the walls and driving their parents crazy. And then they almost seem to stabilize for a few years until okay. until the hormones kick in. And what ends up happening is the risk reward ratio that we as adults view co- to be completely out to lunch <laughs> ends up being amped up to I'm so looking forward to this. <laughs> what? <laughs> so <laughs> looking forward to this stage. As a very I'm I'm getting it with my 10-year-old suddenly. Um but but the but the but the risk reward ratio ends up becoming really out of whack, which is that the things that we would consider to be risky, they consider to be less risky. And their right. reward system for, say, social interaction and social mm, status ends up becoming more important to them. So they right. end up doing more risky behavior for 
more social reward, which we would be like, well, why do you want to go out and, you know, go and hang out with your friends when it's obviously going to put you and make you really tired? They're like, yeah, but that that risk is worth it for the reward because their right. risk reward ratio is way out of whack. When you when you add in the layer of superheroes onto that, <laughs> their <laughs> their risk reward ratio is way out of whack because they're already in risky mm-hmm. situations and the reward is finding purpose, finding connection. Um for Wally it's getting that that trophy that it can put on which is social status with everybody. Right. You know, and it's for some of them, it's being accepted by their godparents, right? Okay, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for some of them, it is finding acceptance amongst their equals. But it's different depending on the hero themselves. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do you want to pull apart a few examples? Sure. (laughs) Well, let's talk about Superboy, because that's who we kind of started with originally. Okay. So he himself, he has uh, his 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 intro is so is so rough because he is actually, um, you know, we find out through the course of the whole show that he's actually going to be a permanent teenager, which right. he ends up having to go through a different sort of mental change throughout the whole show in that he has to accept himself first and foremost, yes. rather right. than try to find belonging elsewhere. Right. So. He has that, are you a weapon or a hero thing? And he has to figure out like, oh, wait, somebody else put that binary choice on me. I don't have to be one or the other, right? I can be something in the middle or neither or whatever. Yeah. And he, um, I mean, theoretically came from a very sheltered childhood because, you know, didn't really know anything, right? (laughs) <laughs> he's not, yeah, not There's, the best parts of homeschooling, uh, I would say. I'll, I'll for him. bring up the parallels to Cadmus and the underworld in a in a minute, but um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's book, we'll bookmark that. Bookmark that. Um, but you know, so he himself, he has gone through these through these these phases where a he he wants to be like his godparent, but he finally understands his human parent. And he's somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah. Oh, God, it's human parent, though. No, uh, because he has to be somewhere in the middle because he can yeah. never be. He can't risk himself to become like the godparent ever so briefly. Right. So so his journey is very right. internal. Yeah. Which is which is so counterintuitive from when you first meet him. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I love about Superboy is that I didn't like him at all. (laughs) In the beginning, I was like, ugh, angsty teen boy. I've said that a million times in the show. And he's so quickly, you were like, whoa, there are a lot of layers going on in this poor kid's head. Uh, And then you find out who his dad is and like this merging of personalities and potentials, you know, genetic potentials for both personality traits and powers and and intellectual traits. Like, I mean, in my opinion, I mean, Superman's no Bruce or Lex. <laughs> but Clark is a skilled investigative reporter. Yeah. And also has a brain that can move at a, at a fairly quick speed here. So uh, to be able to do the things that he's done. So it's not like he's a... You know, the dullest tool in the shed. So Superboy potentially has a huge amount of intellectual, like, potential that is terrifying. And might not be as distracted by, say, the stimuli of the world, which is what I've mm-hmm. always subscribed to as far as what, um, why Superman takes a little bit more time to react sometimes. Interesting. Yeah. He's over overcome with all the stimuli. Right. Superboy has a different set of environmental pressures that allow him to emphasize certain parts of who he is. I talk about this when I talk about marine biology, like why do, Mm -hmm. you know, why do marine mammals develop the way that they did, say, for sleep physiology? Why do they sleep the way that they do? They sleep one hemisphere of the brain at a time and they never are fully unconscious. Well, we're humans or mammals. Why can't we do the same thing? Well, potentially we could, but we've never had the environmental pressures to have to. We could have just crawled into a tree or your house and go unconscious and be relatively safe, but dolphins Mm -hmm. can't do that. So like the different environmental pressures that push 
a, a, a body or a human being forward or, or a, a species forward in a particular direction is so fascinating to me. And putting that on top of the idea of Superboy, like what, what else does he have that he can do? Yeah. And seeing him grow as uh, into an adult, because even though he's physiologically not going to change, I think that his mind, much like when you go through the stages of cognition and how you learn and develop and understand who you are, yeah. will will change. He will become this adult in this kid body, which is kind of sad in a way. <laughs> yeah, it's almost the opposite of what Chris Newton and I were talking about in the Shazam episode where it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Like Shazam in the in Young Justice, he turns into a kid in an adult body. Yeah. And he's got this superpowers in this adult body. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we're in the other direction with Superboy where he's going to be an adult who is always looking 16. That's going to get messed up for him. Yeah. I mean, again, like he was saying in the show, like standard blessing and curse, like I'm always going to look like this, which is good, I guess. But also how seriously do 16 year olds usually get taken? You know, yeah. not very. They, so they deal with this a lot in like, you know, when you deal with immortality and those questions, like from a narrative perspective, this has been a story that has been told. I mean, even God forbid I bring up Twilight, but that idea that you always hey, whatever works, yeah, you know, but whatever, you know, like this idea that you're always going to be treated like this. And although your close personal friends will know that difference, will know that you're actually this age and that you've actually lived and you've had these more more experiences. Society as a whole will always treat him less. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, so uh, Dr. Andrea, who is a host of a show called The Arkham Sessions, if you haven't heard that, you need to go listen to it. It's amazing. So she's a psychologist who breaks down Batman the Animated Series in the ep in episodes and talks about them from a psychological standpoint. Mm -hmm. And one of the episodes that I was listening to was an episode where one of the villains, Baby Doll, is ends up in this kind of really weird relationship with Killer Croc. But Baby Doll is a is a character who was a child star who basically stayed looking that age. And so she has all of this, these layers, go listen to that episode. It's so good. I will. So um, the, these layers of how and why she feels the way that she feels and how she gets treated and how she's trying to be an adult or reformed criminal in her case. And she just doesn't get treated with respect because she still looks like she did on the show. So people treat her like a child. Now, if that happened to someone, would they turn to become a supervillain? I don't know about that. But like, there's still like this deep dive into what does that mean and and how does that affect someone in a different way, which I think is awesome. So, yeah. Okay, now my head's on the Superboy Shazam comparison on the flip <laughs> side. Because because Billy's going to eventually catch up. Yeah. Or maybe even get older. And then when he gets, what happens when Billy's 60 and he says Shazam and he turns into, I don't know, like a muscular 30-year-old or whatever Shazam's actual age And will is. he, will he once he or gets Captain to Marvel. a certain age, ever want to come back from being a superhero? There's a lot of those questions too. Yeah, Chris and I do a deep dive into that right there <laughs> about like why would he ever want to come back and who would he want to be and as a kid and adult. Yeah, you can listen to that episode. That was crazy town. So it's super neat. Um, what uh, did you want to move on to, like, say, Miss Martian? Yeah, let's. I want more. Give me okay. more. Okay. <laughs> so Miss Martian herself, she goes from young, uh, very young adolescent. I would say probably like emotionally, like she displays her. Yeah, she's somewhere in the 11, 12 year, years old range. I would say um, developmentally because she's new to Earth and she. You know, she's <laughs> she's pop culture obsessed, things like that. What and do you mean? By, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Her behavior is entirely normal. Hello, Megan. I'll do it. <laughs> but she by the end of the second season, actually, she's taken on um, this nurturing mother role within what yeah. she is, how she treats Beast Boy and how she views the rest of the team. Right. It's really, really interesting to see her journey. I wish we actually got like more of that five year period because I feel like that's the crux of how she became who she became. But I'm sure that they know they know what what formed that and how how she took on that new mother role, which is really, really fascinating to see her transformation into. 
Yeah, and I wonder how much time she got to spend with Garfield's mom mm. as well to get, because she didn't really have, I mean, we don't know much about her childhood on Mars, except that her father's a white Martian, her mother's a green Martian. We don't know what her relationship with her family is, but whatever happened, it was bad enough that she left her whole planet. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering how much of a, and she clearly had no human mother figure outside of you know, the mother on the show that she was watching. But I wonder if talking to Marie, she got a much more grounded idea of what motherhood is on earth or what the realities of it would be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that she's certainly trying and she, she ends up having this just super fascinating um, reaction when she ends up lashing out almost like a mother on adrenaline in the second season where she uh, she goes after Calder. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, my God. That scene gets me every time. It's just this, like, protective instinct. Right. That ends up kind of coming forward. And I just find it really fascinating that her character changed that much and that she took on that more mother role within the group. There's some irony there with her mother role and her almost... Mm, I don't know. I don't know the word I want to use. She's got the mother, motherly protective role that she has going on, but the violence and the lack of maybe empathy, like mm-hmm. for who she defines as a villain, it became very black and white for her in an extreme way. Well, I think that like, yeah, she, she definitely like drew a line in the sand around right. who she was protecting and that those people were only the people that were in the cave. It's kind of an us or them thing, which yeah. is ironic coming from a white Martian who was abused on Mars. Interesting. I never thought about that. But I think that that's actually quite common when you, when you end up thinking about survival instinct of your young, you will choose your young over others. Yeah, don't mess with my kids. Yeah. Right. So that's that's a quite quite a common thread from a psychological perspective, but also from like, a, you know, tribalism, you know, right. like you have to you have to choose your own people. And if you've betrayed your people, you're out. Interesting. Is there a mythological parallel to that in any way? I'm trying to think of my pantheons and the, the stories that I do know. I mean, well, so like the Argo itself, I, I like there's a lot of parallels with Young Justice and the team that is the on the Argo, the Argonauts. I don't know as much about the Argonauts. I think I watched one of the old like stop motion movies <laughs> back in the day, Jason and the Argonauts. But I, I think that's about the extent of my knowledge. Can you can you dive into that a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, sure. So uh, the Argonauts are a team that was uh, led by Jason, who was this prince who was favored by Hera over uh, his half siblings, I think. <laughs> his eight- This is Greek mythology, right? So everybody was begetting everyone else at that <laughs> point. So different people that that claimed his throne. And Hera said, well, you know, if you go and do these missions, if you go and get the golden fleece, you know, you're going to be favored and you're going to end up being king. And Jason, who, I mean, kind of is like this not reluctant hero, but really wants to prove himself, ends up pulling together the best of the best. And all of the other people who are on the Argo are all demigods. So we have Hercules. Okay. Who is this very um, Superboy like figure? Hercules was on the Argo. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Her- Hercules was on the Argo. You have Castor and Pollock. Um, you have several sons of Poseidon. <laughs> you have uh, several on. sons what? of Apollo. Yeah. Wait, do they all have like demigod like powers? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're all I am like freaking out right now. Yeah. I had no idea. I thought they were just a bunch of sailors. No, um, like you have the sons, the twin sons what? of uh Boris, Boralus, the north wind god. Yeah. You have Orpheus, who's actually quite famous, the son of Apollo, who was one of the gifted musicians. You know, you have the sons of Hermes, you have the son of Helios. There's, they're all out on this adventure on the best boat that has ever been created, the Argo. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. Like, 
that was like the first super team? Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, you're blowing my mind right now. I'm going to have to go. Conclude part one, part two, T minus seven days. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.